Hello and welcome to The Conversation. I am Sibusisi Wenyanda. And on today's show, we're taking you to Western or Central Africa, depending on your point of view. Cameroon is set to hold its legislative and municipal elections on the 9th of February, but that's not without resistance from the country's official opposition, as well as an Anglophone southern region that's fighting for secession. Will this election be a success? And what are President Paul Pierre's greatest challenges we look at that in today's episode of the conversation we start now stay with us Joining me on the conversation today are familiar faces. We're joined by Deemi Saka, who's a media consultant and media affairs analyst, as well as Esther Nwanko, who's also a public affairs analyst and legal professional. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm happy to see this combination because we've seen you in isolation. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to engaging with the two of you uh, here today. Let's get into the introduction, right? Um, the last legislative polls were held in 2013 for five-year terms in Cameroon. Now, President Paul Bia, who was re-elected in 2018, has twice postponed these elections. The 2018 presidential election stoked a political crisis. Opposition leader Maurice Kamto was imprisoned along with some of his supporters for denouncing electoral fraud through marches. Since his release in October, Kamto's attempts to hold public meetings have not been approved by authorities. Nonetheless, Cameroonian authorities insist that this year's legislative elections will go off without a hitch. Eno Abrams Egbe, who's the chairperson of ELECAM, that's the Cameroonian Electoral Board, said elections will be well organized, credible and transparent. I'm going to quote him here as saying, our objective is to encourage and facilitate dialogue and information sharing among stakeholders of the electoral process for early identification of potential risks and the mitigation of adverse effects of misinformation and violent extremism before, during, and after the elections. Okay, so that's a really big statement uh, for the for the electoral chairperson to have said, given the fact that at this stage they faced, uh, you know, chances of these elections being postponed, and there's plenty rejection. I'm going to call it rejection from the people, whether you're looking at uh, francophone Cameroon or you're looking at anglophone Cameroon. Mm -hmm. So, what is the likelihood that these elections will be free and fair? I'm going to start with you, Esther. Okay, I'm going to put it this way: This is Africa, and. Um me saying this is Africa, I am is already smiling. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is the election in Africa, I'm sorry to say. Um, for right now, you can't talk about free and fair election. No? African leaders have been known to be people who are one, selfish, interest guided, and people who actually would prefer, you know, looking out for them and whatever cabal, as we will call it in Nigeria, they are for, you know, than even the people they are supposed to be governing. Now, this is a man who you had opportunity to prove to the people that you could earn that trust by, you know, conducting elections and you postponed it because you felt you had power. And this is a nation who has had this issue of conflict of you know those from the anglophonic side thinking are we really a part of cameroon and you know those from the francophonic side saying we are the real cameroonians this was your time to show the people that you know what let's do this we would still come back, even though we, we, it was made a new uh, unitary state in 1972, we can still bring back power and we can make Cameroon work. This is a nation whose population is not even up to a quarter of Nigeria. They have more opportunity to be better. But guess what? It still hasn't worked out. So for me, I would say free and fair election in Cameroon. Mm -mm. You don't see it happening. I'm sorry. Okay, so, you know, we're speaking here in, in, in uncertain terms, but what are some of the main critiques uh, against uh, President Paul Bia's regime? What are the main issues that the people of Cameroon have with his presidency? Yeah, you, you get tired of uh, saying a face for over 20, 30 years. You, you want to climb up for change, and that's what's happening. Yes, he's been accused of being rigid and um, suppressing oppositions, violently using state um, machineries. And, you want to, at a point in human, as every human being want to climb up for change, you want something new. As we speak, Cameroonians are finding his leadership uninspiring, whether the Anglophone or what Francophone speaking side. It's uninspiring, they want something new, fresh, a, a breath of fresh air. But for me, uh, I, it goes beyond that. Everywhere in the whole world, across the, everywhere across the globe, 
elections, whatever form of government is formed around interest. You protect the interest of your backers at the same time trying to serve the people. So is, if that's what's going to happen, if, that, if I see that happening in Cameroon, it might happen. But Paul Bia has lost credibility, not because of um, what, he has, uh, what he has done, but what he hasn't done. The last election was everybody complained about it. And um, this election was postponed, not because they had power, but because there's been this crisis and they were fighting. If you're not careful, civil war might be cutting in, in Cameroon. And that is what I think any right-thinking government should deal with. Let's suppress this um, separatist movement. Let's stop this agitation for a, for a divided Cameroon and let's see if that will work. That's for me what, what should be the, the priority of the government. You cannot come, I don't see this election holding mm. in the midst of this crisis. And it's around the corner, I mean, the 9th of February, that's next week or the <laughs> week after, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Now, Esther, you are our legal luminary. Okay. Uh, let's speak about the constitution, right? It's, it's in contravention. Should they postpone these elections, they are in contravention of the country's constitution. Uh, some people would argue that that doesn't really mean much because the country is only a democracy in name. But I would like to ask you, in, in very certain terms, what does this mean? If they aren't able to hold these elections on the 9th of February, they are in contravention of their own constitution, what then will happen? Or what should happen in a democracy? Okay, so if you're talking about a democracy, we will generally give it, we have this general definition, saying it's a government by the people, you know, for the people, and also headed by, you know, the people themselves. Yeah. Now, it, it's supposed to be a case of you putting the people first. But then democracy has failed in Cameroon, and that should be noted. You have crises that are spanned for over 15 years. In and out, young people are dying, the old and the elderly, their lives are not sustained, the people are not doing well. And at the same time, you come up to say that you are a democratic republic. That in itself is contrasting. And also, if you are a democratic nation, you should allow the request of the people to stand. A great number of Cameroonians want a new leader. They feel that their incumbent president has not done so well. If you have a constitution that is working as a nation, you should honor the, you know, the, the, the um, writings of that constitution, what it is enshrined what's it's um uh, what is enshrined in it but then also in africa there's also been issues of constitutions being created and then years later as the democracy changes there has been the issue of amendment the nigerian constitution example uh, the 1999 constitution as amended is a classic example there are many parts of that constitution that is part of the issues affecting this country today the same thing applies to cameroon now the incumbent president will come out and give you a law from that same constitution giving him powers to do what he's doing and tell you that because he's trying to keep national peace that's why he's postponing the elections but in truth if it's a current true democratic republic, as you claim it to be, as it was taught by the Greek states who originated democracy, you should know that when you are a president that in your own time, crisis still exists and has not stopped. In fact, its level has developed and increased. You should be able to step down. You should be able to respect the people enough and preserve their lives and all that concerns them enough to keep the peace. Speaking of keeping the peace and speaking of, you know, whether or not Cameroon is a democracy, central to the existence of a healthy democracy is public discourse. And we often hear uh, the government speaking about, oh, we, we, we encourage dialogue. This is what we want to see. But then dissenting voices often find themselves uh, at the hands of the harshest hand of the law. So what do you make of the state on the one hand saying one thing, but on the other hand, we've seen uh, the imprisonment of a Maurice uh, Kamto who leads the, the main opposition of the country's uh, current presidency. So what, what do you make of, on the one hand, in theory, we're being told we encourage discourse and, and, and dialogue. On the other hand, it's often quelled. I, I would say the Cameroonian government, uh, led by Paul Bia, is on serious. Uh, it's like you telling your child to come. I'm not, uh, okay, come, come tell me the truth. I'm holding the king. The child will never trust you, no matter how compassionate you, you sound or you sing. So for me, yeah, we should take a cue from South Africa when Nelson Mandela became the person, little Nelson Mandela, he set up the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and everybody came out and there was nobody, no wind chanting, you were not prosecuted because of testimonies or what have you. I think if Cameroon wants to move forward as a nation, 
that's what they should look at. They should take a cue probably and go to South Africa and buy the template. I'm not campaigning for South Africa, but that's the truth. And away from that, I think Paul, the, for me, the, the simplest solution and the way out of this thing is probably for Paul Bia to stand down mm. for the sake of um, the unity of the country because the country is divided. I think if Paul Bia stands down, 50% of the agitations is off. And we start, everybody can now start on a fresh template, everybody comes with new demands to the table. And you, that's, for me, that's just the only simplest solution to it. If we had enough time, I would ask you, do you think that he's set enough of a, a plan in terms of who should then succeed him? Do we have a succession no, there's, there's plan a, there's a, there's a in, constitution. in Cameroon? I, I, don't think the, I don't think the government of, um, and there's a, there'll be higher king government in, in Cameroon. So it's not about Paul Bia, Paul Bia, Paul Bia, Paul Bia. There's, there's somebody in line, next in line to take over. I think there's a, there's the legislative is there, so there's going to be the head of the legislative. The head will be there, could could take over. There's the head of the judiciary to take over. So there's some there's a plan. There's a, it doesn't have to be somebody anointed by him. The process, the structure in place, guaranteed by the constitution, will definitely throw up a leader. Okay, I guess it takes us back to your point about the legitimacy mm. of a country's constitution, where we've seen that democracy almost falling apart for almost two decades. And very true. Over two decades. <laughs> well, yes, but the thing is, there's a very important part of this puzzle that we seem to be forgetting, and that is the people. Mm. Now, at the end of the day, no matter how powerful a leader is, no matter how great his political ambitions are, no matter how much of political interest he has, you know, to control power, wealth, and finance in the nation. If he doesn't have the support of the people, or some part of the people, he's not going to be able to succeed with it. So now, Cameroonians in themselves do have to come together. That thing of, oh, I'm from the French side, oh, I'm from the side that was colonized by the British, they need to stop that. They need we to tell gonna themselves get, We're going to the get into that immediately after mm. this break because we're going to be looking at the Amazonia question. President Paul Bia is of course grappling with the threat of secession from the English-speaking Cameroon. More on this after the break but remember we want to hear what you think on social media. We're at New Central TV on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Use our hashtag NC the conversation so we can keep track of what you're saying. We're going to talk about exactly what Esther just said. Can the people of Cameroon unite and forget about the French and English divisions. We talk about that after the stay with us. This is The Conversation, and I'm Sibu Sisiwe You're welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're discussing Cameroon's upcoming legislative elections that, of course, are set to take place on the 9th of February. Of course, the question at hand right now is whether or not these elections will indeed happen. Will they be free? Will they be peaceful? Will they be fair? Remember, this is a conversation with you on social media. Keep track of our hashtag NCTheConversation, and we can keep track of what you're thinking, too. Now, what is Ambazonia? There is a governing council in the country, uh, and this is the name of separatists that have chosen to give Cameroon's Anglophone Northwest and Southwest regions this name, right? And these citizens say they've been marginalized for decades by the central government and French-speaking majority. The current crisis we see in the country started in 2016 when lawyers and teachers went on strike. They were arguing against the use of French in courts and schools. And then in October 2017, activists declared autonomy over the two English-speaking regions. And that was a move that, of course, would have been rejected by President Paul Bia. Now, say, some took up arms in 2017, and the crisis forced more than 500,000 people, that's half a million people, um, to lose their homes. And, of course, dozens of people were killed. What does the international community have to say about this question around Ambazonia? Let's take a look at that quickly. For us to say that you delayed the decentralization process for 23 years until we are pushed to these people where people have died, then we are reminded of the fact that okay, every thing will be affected now. We hope that the special status that we have given us is not going to take 23 other years for us to realize the special status. Je trouve que c'est la solution idoine au problème qui permet de préserver la l'unité nationale tout en reconnaissant la spécificité et les particularités culturelles de nos frères du nord-ouest et du sud-ouest. 
Okay, so there we have it. Initially, that was the chairperson of Elecam, who we spoke about a little bit earlier, and he mm. was speaking on the legitimacy of these February 9th elections. Now, let's talk about Ambazonia. Uh, we've seen a lot of force on both sides, so we can't at this stage say there's an innocent party. But I'm going to ask you out and out again, legal luminary. Is Ambazonia, or its formation rather, a national security threat? In a way, and it depends. Now, I'll bring this back to the Nigerian Civil War, 1967 to 1970, when Biafra existed, and of course we knew that um, they wanted to be cut off from the Nigerian Republic in itself at the time. It was said that, yes, Biafra started also with the Easterners feeling that, you know, they were contributing so much to the building of the economy of Nigeria, but yet weren't given as much respect, accorded as much respect as they felt that they deserved. So you know what? Rather than President Gowon at that time calling Ojuku, who was, you know, the founding father of this said movement or nation to be at the time, to other than saying, yes, there were the accords that were held, they had the peace accords and all of that, but it should have been stopped before it even happened. Over three million people died, Igbos to be very specific, and some part of southern, southeast Nigeria. A lot of people from Delta State, Edo State, some part of Edo State, people died all over the place. Ambia State, of course, Ebo in these states were not in existence at that time by name, but those villages were. And each family had somebody they sacrificed. On the Nigerian side, too, there were people who had fathers, brothers, uncles, who went to fight in the war for the Nigerian army. And that also was bloody. Many people died. For this case of Ambazonia and, you know, the Republic of Cameroon, I would prefer that the incumbent president calls for it. And it's either you are telling yourself the truth of the, you know, good coexistence of these regions. If it's going to work or it's not. Classic example, see what Sudan did. They went away when they knew it wasn't working. And at the same time, if you know that you claim that you can handle it, you should have by now, after what happened in 2016, put in the mechanisms to make sure that you win the trust of the people from these regions. But no, consistently you have ignored their cries. Yes, they have been pushed to the point of using force which I do not support, but hey. I like the way you say they've been pushed. Yes. You can already tell which side. No, I'm not on anybody's know. side, but but if you have, I'm saying this because I schooled yeah. in Calabar. Yeah. All right? And I left school in 2018. Now, at some point staying in Calabar, half of the population in my area in Satellite Town were Cameroonians from Douala mm. who had run off mm. from the crisis in their areas. Some of them came in through the borders and, you know, they were begging immigration officials. If you were traveling through Ikotek, you will see them by the roadside with their stuff. Yeah. I saw a woman whose breast was cut off mm. from that same crisis. And she was begging them, please, my country is not safe. I cannot go back to my village. They've killed my husband. In a case like that, you are going to have to be compassionate at some point I and you. tell yourself the truth. Okay, so we're getting here uh, very much what the social political effects of this would have been. But I would like to know from you what your thoughts are on some people from Human Rights Watch, from Amnesty International, suggesting, yes, of course, there is a social political element and these concerns are real. But that also there are big oil interests that are at hand here and that this is more of an economically orchestrated conflict that we're seeing where Ambazonia is concerned. Every conflict is inspired or bad, bad by economic interest. The civil, Nigerian civil war, the cold war, you want to call it, even though no shots were fired. So it's, no, it's, it's normal, it's normal when it comes to conflict like this and when it comes to, because it, it comes, you, you declare as poison of war. I, I support you to get your freedom, I finance you, I get you the um, arms and munitions and after that you guarantee me limitless access mm. to your natural resources. Oil, and gas, dam, that Liberia, sorry for my choice of words, went through because of diamond. Same thing with Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone fact was worse off than Liberia because Sierra Leone has oil, diamond as well. And had, so you look, even South Sudan is even experiencing, even the South Sudan, a new nation is experiencing that because it has, it has numerous mineral resources and where you, you know. So for me, you, you could always pick the, the, the economic interest of multinationals. I can tell you this, the largest industry after oil and gas is arms. And that is the only sector or industry you can deal, transact, you can deal, you can get involved legitimately and illegitimately. Both government and individual buys, buy arms legitimately and illegitimately. You buy from the black market, you buy from the manufacturers. 
depending on the operations when you embark on, depending on the urgency or the how, how, how you need how much you need the weapons and what have you or the weapons. So away from that. But for me, it is not enough for the international communities to just make such allegations or allusions. I think for they should they should come up with a template. And for, it, I'm a guy that always believes there's always political solutions to everything. This is the Hindi speaking side, this is the African um, French speaking side. Come up with a constitution, constitutional presidency. Why this average French speaking side brings shows up the president, you give us the prime minister. The next election, you big girl, give us the president, you come with the prime minister, and it's settled, and everybody, everybody's happy. They are politi- they can always political solutions to mm-hmm. these. It's not it's not rocket science. We're human beings, we're not talking, it's not human beings communicating with AI robots that is running on artificial intelligence. We're human beings that have emotions. I you know they've intermarried. So it, it, I, it, for me, if they love their country, they should sit down and find political solutions to this. And for me, like I said earlier, the priority is not even about these elections. The priority is about healing. It's just sustaining the country. The country is disintegrating. And you're talking about elections. It's like, it's like you treating green gum and living leprosy. Okay. We don't even have enough time. I had so many more questions uh, mm-hmm. about this discussion, but I, my director is pushing me to wrap up. But just in closing, I'd just like to, to find out from you, Esther, mm-hmm. what your thoughts are on, you know, this was a problem that was created by colonial powers, mm-hmm. uh, namely Germany, Britain, France. Yep. Do they have a responsibility in being part of the solution? Okay. They do have a responsibility in being part of the solution because in the first place, they brought the problem, you know, the existence of a, the anglophonic British protectorate came from the British taking that, you know, part of Cameroon that they took and then the other countries too who colonized the other regions. They have a part to play in it, they have a part to play, but I don't think they would want to do that. Mm, until, until things seem a little bit stable. And, <laughs> okay, finally, rapid fire questions. Will the February 9 elections be free and fair, yay, nay? <laughs> No. No. Hell okay, no. that's a unanimous no. And then finally, do we possibly have a civil war at our hands? Yes. Great possibility. Eighty-five percent right now. Emphatically. Wow. Okay. So a little bit of a gloomy end to our show, but of course you can weigh in on social media and let us know what your thoughts are on the situation in Cameroon. We'll be keeping a close eye. We will definitely be discussing it in the conversation as well. Remember to use our hashtag NC the Conversation and follow us and follow this discussion at New Central TV www.newcentral.africa is where you can find all the latest in our current affairs stories. I'm Sibusi Suwenyanda. Thank you so much to my two guests for coming. Until our next conversation, have a good evening. It's goodbye from me for now.